So what do you think of when I say shape or shapes? Your mind might conjure up, you know, the good old tried and true square, circle, triangle. And, uh, you know, shape has been part of our uh, lives as artists from as far back as we can remember. Uh, just like line, it is one of the first things that we uh, learn to do as young artists. Uh, draw a circle. You know, <clears throat> once you grab, graduate from scribbles, what's the next challenge? Try to draw a circle. Uh, so, you know, we, we think oftentimes in fairly simplistic terms about shape, but uh, it can be a much more um, uh, intriguing part of what you do as an artist. Uh, so uh, let's take a look uh, at shape um, with, in a little more depth, okay? Like shapes are like the architectural building blocks of a composition. Um, they you know, one definition is it's it's just as a visually perceived area, right? And however you differentiate that area from its surroundings uh, is up to you. Like you can use line to outline a shape. You can use, uh, you know, if you had a red background with a green shape in front of it, you can define shapes with color or value or texture. You know, um, however you can define it, it is a separate area, right? With with um, you know boundaries, okay. So in its, its, its simplest terms, it's just a, a visually perceived area. Uh, so here are a few of the vocabulary words we'll we'll kind of cover over the course of our discussion today. Um, at, we're going to start, like I said at the beginning, like, like kind of that first thought when you think of shape. We oftentimes go to geometric shapes, right? You know, any shape essentially that appears to be related to geometry, uh, like squares, circles, triangles, um, typically has a kind of mechanical quality to it, right? Um, oftentimes very clearly defined edges, right? Uh, sharply defined, uh, but not always. Um, so geometric shapes typically have a, a, you know, kind of made by human hands kind of look to them. Uh, at least that's where we, we, you know, we jump to that uh, conclusion very quickly. But, you know, there are plenty of examples in nature of geometric shapes, like, um, like honeycomb, um, you know, shapes or, or snowflakes. You ever look at a snowflake under a microscope? Uh, or uh, uh, a spiral, right? Like a nautilus shell spiral, that's geometry um, from nature itself. And, and after all, we humans are part of nature. We are supposed to be. And so uh, that geometric uh, quality that we construct is still, you know, part of um, the bigger picture. So um, geometric shapes typically fall into two categories. Uh, like uh, this is a rectilinear uh, painting by Charles Sheeler. Uh, you know, lots of rectangles and squares, and it's very grid-like, like has that industrial look. Uh, but I want you to note that Sheeler has um, this cloud motif running through the top, right? More organic shapes to kind of counterbalance that geometry. Smart. And more about that later. That's really one of the big things that I want you to take away from this and apply to your work is that contrast in shapes, right? Um, okay, so there are also curvilinear shapes, more circular, right? Ovals, um, softer, rounded, uh, you know, circles still hold a certain power for us. When we see circles, it has a certain way of getting our attention. Uh, so 
Um, think about, you know, that contrast. Within geometry, there is rectilinear and curvilinear uh, geometric shapes that you can use in your work. Okay. Uh, so here's an example of uh, another rectilinear piece by O'Keefe, right? Uh, the radiator building. Um, so biomorphic shapes are life shapes, right? Biomorph. Uh, they're organic and uh, they have a flowing quality. Um, they uh, tend to be more rounded and they suggestive of nature or, you know, kind of uh, living organisms. Um, so, you know, again, or compared to geometry, like biomorphic shapes uh, have that softer, more lifelike quality to them. Uh, uh, so, if you were to look at this Matisse painting, you know, he's got this grid of rectangles running behind all these other shapes, but they, there is um, a definite feeling of uh, a more natural, organic quality to these shapes. They're softer. And so, that again, that contrast between geometric and biomorphic, uh, a really important decision that you can make as an artist. Um, Here's an Adolf Gottlieb abstract expressionist painting. And we we see those circles above as being clearly geometric, but he, you know, he kind of softens the edge, you're not perfect, and then we have this squiggle of shapes and lines down beneath that contrast with that. Um, there's an energy uh, to both kinds of shapes. Uh, and again, you need to learn to negotiate um, how to use both of them in your work. Okay. Um, all right. So moving on, let's talk about actual shapes. And this is most of the shapes that you encounter. They are actually there. Uh, they're clearly defined. Um, you know, and here, you know, like, uh, Albers is defining these squares with color, right? So, um, I, you know, and we only point out actual shapes because it's pretty obvious that most of the shapes we see are actual in comparison to implied shapes or like suggested shapes, right? And again, whenever the human mind encounters something that's incomplete, we want to complete it. We, we naturally um, see the you know, parts... Um, and the whole, right? Like we want to see the whole thing, even if we're only presented with pieces of the puzzle, right? And so shapes are no different. Like uh, the first shape on the left, you instantly recognize that as a square. But it's really just four dots. You know, our mind connects the dots and creates the shape. Same thing with like horizontal lines uh, oriented in such a way that it looks like a triangle. And the circle on the right, none of these are actual shapes. They're all implied. None of them are complete, but we complete them in our mind's eye. And again, oftentimes, giving somebody only part of a shape creates a puzzle that they have to um, solve. Even if they don't know that they're doing it, it's, it's more intriguing. So oftentimes, when you let shapes come off the edge of the picture plane, you're creating a, a more intriguing image when you do that, right? Uh, if you only give somebody part of the story and, and it's up to them to fill in the blanks, uh, it's, you know, it's, it's going to engage the viewer. Uh, here, we've got these four, like three Pac-Man shapes uh, or pizzas with one slice taken out. Uh, but we, again, clearly jump to the negative space and see the triangle that's implied there, right? You get the idea. There's a circle. Is it really a circle? No, it's just the implication of one. These lines converge to um, uh, create that circle in the negative space. All right. 
Now, amorphous shapes are not clearly defined. It's like we can't really put our finger on what they are. Um, but we, we know a shape when we see it, but we don't always know what the heck is going on there. And so these are more ambiguous, um, you know, mysterious shapes. Like here's the, you know, impressionist master Monet. And unless you went and, and like read the placard next to this in museum and, re you know, and figured out that it was water lilies, if you'd just never seen one of these before and looked at it on the wall without having any other information, you'd be hard pressed to really figure out what was going on. Uh, I mean, he gives you clues, but he kind of delights in not giving you a very clearly defined shape with clearly defined edges, right? Again, more intriguing. All right. All right, so we need to talk about uh, flat shapes and planar shapes and decorative versus plastic. Um, and this has to do with, with space, right? How shape and space interact with each other. Uh, so flat shapes stress two-dimensional surface. Uh, it, and planar shapes, you can take that same flat shape and kind of tilt it, right? Uh, to create the suggestion of space. And, and you can overlap things, right? To, again, uh, create the illusion of depth. Uh, so, like here's some Ellsworth Kelly shapes, clearly just meant to be flat. They're not trying to do anything other than uh, kind of announce their presence on a flat surface. Okay, and that has a certain charm, right? There are times when you need that. Uh, and here's Victor Vassarelli uh, taking similar shapes and tilting them and suggesting space, like either suggesting volume, or depth, right? Um, so flat versus planar. Kind of interesting. Now, going back to flat, we oftentimes in design talk about um, decorative elements. And, and it's not just like, oh, I'm going to decorate this. Uh, it's not about interior decoration necessarily. It's about flat surfaces. Uh, a decorative shape is a flat shape, again, that um, calls attention to that two-dimensional surface. Okay? It stresses flatness. All right, so here's a Matisse uh, stained window. Flat as a pancake. Colorful, beautiful, active, but flat shapes. There's no attempt at illusion here, right? Uh, now, on the flip side of decorative is plastic. And here, you know, the artist is trying to create the illusion of depth on a two-dimensional surface. That's usually done through light and shadow, the play of highlights and shadows on a shape. Um, that's what we call a plastic shape, right? Uh, so, here's a Caravaggio painting. The shapes that make up this figure, he has um, a clear light source uh, that uh, hits these shapes. He uh, accentuates those highlights and creates cast shadows. Um, and the result is a sense of deep space. Even though this is a, a flat canvas, we see it as having deep space, right? Um, so, um, highlight and shadow on a shape, plastic. So, plastic shapes can suggest volume. Like here, just like planar shapes, if you angle a shape, but then add a little bit of highlight, a little bit of shadow, you can suggest the containment of space, right? Um, interesting. Can also suggest weight, right? Uh, mass. If you, um, you know, arrange the shapes just right, and again use a little bit of highlight and shadow, you can suggest like, um, that a shape have mass, has weight. Like the figures here, we feel through um, uh, Titian's use of light and shadow. Each one of these, you know, figures has mass. All right equivocal shapes. What are these? Well, equivocal 
if you think about the meaning of the word vocal, we know it's vo like voice, right? Uh, and eque from the Latin like root, if you go far enough back, you'll find, you know, equal. Um, and in that is the implication that there are, there's more than one, right? And in this way, there's more than one voice. There's more than one meaning, more than one relationship. Okay. So you can have a single shape that has multiple ways of being interpreted. Uh, or sometimes it's a relationship of a couple of shapes that um, equivocates. It, there's more than one voice at work. There's more than one way to interpret it. Make sense? So uh, you've seen this before. It's a vase, right? Or is it two faces, right? Uh, it's equivocal. This one, if you look at it long enough, will drive you crazy. Um, there's that play between positive and negative. But, you know, I'm not sure which is which in this thing. This one really drives me crazy. I don't know about you guys, but it, it'll drive me nuts if I look at it long enough. So I'm switching the slide. Uh, this is a, a good old, you know, a good old fashioned um, mind bender. Uh, there is, uh, there are shapes here that suggest a young woman and shapes that suggest an older woman, right? Do you see both? Uh, like if you look at, uh, like if you see the young woman, uh, look at her uh, cheek and chin uh, and her jawline. Uh, if you then stop and think about that same shape as forming the nose of the old woman, right? And if you see the old woman, reverse that. Anyway, like the old woman's face is much larger than the young woman's face. So uh, pause the video and figure it out if you don't see both of them. Okay. Equivocal. That's your $5 word for today. All right. So objective shapes and subjective shapes. And this really goes back to uh, that notion of um, realism versus abstraction, right? Um if a shape is objective, we can kind of agree on it. Like we recognize it from nature pretty quickly, right? And so we can be objective about these things, or at least we can agree to a certain point. But it, as soon as we kind of start using our imagination and turn things over to the life of the mind, then we can start to be more subjective in our approach to art. Uh, and, you know, we don't always agree on seeing things the same way. And so, again, when shapes start to be born more of the mind than our visual reality, that's subjective. Okay, so let's look at Picasso. He's easy. Uh, on the left is a portrait he painted of Olga. It's objective. We see it. It's um, the illusion of um, um, those shapes uh, we can agree on what they are, for the most part. Now, on the right-hand side is a portrait of the same woman, <laughs> right? Much more abstract, uh, much more subjective. This is Picasso's mind interpreting those shapes and presenting them to us. Make sense? Objective, subjective. Uh, like visual reality, and then... Um, the reality of the mind. Okay. Uh, here's another kind of interesting play on subjective and objective. This is Dorothea Tanning, a surrealist painter. Uh, and a lot of her work blurs the line between, you know, illusionistic or objective shapes and more subjective shapes. Like there are, like there are elements here that I can pick out. There's like horse and there's, um, you know, uh, people, um, and there are wings that like, these are kind of recognizable objective shapes. And then there are shapes that just disintegrate into her imagination, uh, and become subjective. So uh, the surrealists would oftentimes blur the line between subjective and objective, right? In the same piece. All right. So I want you to tell me about these things. You can pause the video and kind of go through 
and think about the different categories that these works would fall into in terms of shape. All right, for instance, here, like you can pause it and, and think about it yourself first. And I've given you a list of um, different types of shapes uh, on the left there. So this one, what's going on here? Um, is this geometric or biomorphic? It's more geometric, right? And of the geometric types, is it um, curvilinear or rectilinear? It's got straight edges, right? It's more rectilinear. Um, are these predominantly actual shapes? Are any of them really complete? Like they're all suggestive kind of triangles, but none of them are really complete, right? So implied as opposed to actual. Um, so I can go through the list and see if any of the other uh, kind of categories of shape apply here. How about this one? Odelon Redon. Um, is there more geometric going on here or biomorphic? Yeah, it's much more organic, biomorphic shapes. Um, how about amorphous shapes? I mean, I can kind of tell, you know, there's a person there and there's some flowers, but look at the background. Look, there's, you know, uh, there's not a lot to hold on to there. It's, it's very amorphous. Uh, and, and maybe also it's kind of, again, uh, in the foreground, we've got more objective kind of recognizable elements. And as we move to the background, it becomes more subjective. Okay. So all within the same work of art, there is contrasting shapes. Okay. Uh, and you need to start thinking about doing this in your own work. Don't leave shape out. Don't just reach for what is a convenient shape. Think about strategies that you can use to make your work more intriguing in terms of your use of shape. Here's Frank Stella from his Protractor series. And I don't know if you know what a protractor is, but you use it in math to like figure out uh, degrees. But um, like this is obviously geometric. Uh, it is um, curvilinear, right? Uh, and again, are these completed shapes? Nope. He doesn't give us a single complete protractor shape. They're, it's all broken up. It's all incomplete. It's all implied, right? Okay. Uh, and is this decorative or plastic? flat as a pancake. It's decorative, right? Okay, again, here's Mondrian. Um, there's clearly some geometry at work here. There, there are circles, uh, there are some angular lines, curvilinear and rectilinear, um, but the whole thing feels more organic, more biomorphic, right? So, again, he's kind of walking the line between geometric and biomorphic. Uh, again, are there a lot of completed shapes here? No, there is a lot of implied shape at work, and it makes it more intriguing. All right. Uh, here's Tom Wesselman. And you know, a lot of Wesselman's work is more decorative than this one is, much flatter. But here he's, he's suggesting a little bit more plastic shape. Like there's a little bit of highlight and shadow in places, right? Not a lot, but enough. Uh, but again, there's this play back and forth between decorative and plastic in his work at this stage. That's kind of intriguing. And there are a lot of incomplete shapes here, right? He lets a lot of these shapes come off the edge of the picture plane. And so we have to complete them in our mind's eye. Uh, like those flower shapes. He doesn't give us the complete shape. Um, there's actually a picture frame in the foreground. We just get the top of the person's head and, and the suggestion of a rectangle. Uh, get the idea. And again, geometric and biomorphic in the same piece. How about this one? It's equivocal, right? Do you see the ducky? Do you see the bunny? 
there's both, right? Equivocal. It's like a single shape that can be interpreted in more than one way. Okay. Uh, intentionally ambiguous. Um, okay. Uh, this one like by Rene Magritte, like we clearly see the geometric and biomorphic, right? The geometric interior, the architecture, and then the clouds and the sky in the, in the distance. Uh, or is it in the distance, right? This is also equivocal. Uh, is that a window or is it uh, just doors that have been painted to look like they have clouds on them? Uh, you know, if, if you open this thing up and you see the dark void in between the two panels, it's like it's a painting. But if you look at the top of that open window, uh, you can see through it to um, the trim around it. So which is it? Is it transparent? Is it opaque? Is it inside? Is it outside? Um, there's a lot going on here. Again, the surrealists will mess with you if you let them, and they're brilliant at using shape to um, kind of get their ideas across. Okay, um, and so finally, what's going on here? Um, is this decorative or plastic? It feels more plastic, although I'm not quite sure is that are those highlights and shadows? What's going on here? There's a lot of transparency. Um, is it um, geometric? No, it's biomorphic. Um, it um, you know, it has a certain feeling. It's like none of these shapes are really clearly defined, right? So they're amorphous. Um, all right, so I want you to take some time and think about shape and how you use it in your own work. Come up with a strategy. Remember, the elements and principles of design, like you should have that printed out and keep it right next to where you work uh, and consult with that list, like uh, the elements, the building blocks, the principles, the guiding organizational structure of your design endeavors. Like you need to make sure that you're checking off each one, am I, am I considering shape, right? How am I using contrasting shapes to enliven my work and get my viewers interested and excited about what they're seeing, right? Uh, again, shape is deceptively simple. We've been using shapes our whole lives and thinking about shapes and using them in our artwork, but we don't always really stop and investigate how we're using them. Um, so I encourage you to do that. Uh, especially geometric and biomorphic. So important. All right. There you have it. Um, uh, take care. I'll talk to you soon.